So I'd like you to kind of shake off all of that information and data that Lori presented to us. And as she said too, it's not just the questions that she's interested in hearing from you, but it's also the opportunity for you to maybe make some, be a sense maker of the data that she was giving you. So, uh, so be, be kind of mulling that about in your head as uh, we move to our next presenter. And just a real pleasure to have um, some of our local academic um, uh, expertise from uh, uh, University of British Columbia with us, Dr. Mu Chung Yang. He's a professor at the University of British Columbia uh, School of Social Work. As an applied social researcher, he has been actively engaging in immigration studies for over 10 years. He has, the pr he has been principal or co-investigators of over 10 research projects related to service needs of and approaches for immigrants, labor market and racial violence, experience of youth from immigrant families, place-based organization and immigrant social integration, and settlement service programming. He has published over 50 journal articles in different Canadian and international scholarly journals. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mu Chung Yang and his presentation title, The Immigration Settlement Service Gaps in British Columbia's Rural Regions. Um, good morning, everybody. I uh, haven't seen you for a while. Um, good to see you here again, and thank you for EMSA for organizing this E symposium. Um, and also thank you for uh, putting Lori before me, uh, because she really set a good context for my presentation. I don't have so many juicy and sexy information to stimulate you, uh, but we do have some interesting findings regarding the uh, rural... Uh, Oh, that's a different page. Uh, regarding the rural um, settlement service in BC. Um, oh, use this one. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to learn a new technology. Oh, not this one. Uh, no, yours. Ah, mine. OK, this is me. <laughs> Um, before I start, I have to uh, acknowledge you know, the uh, great contribution of my uh, research associate, Jenny Francis, she's sitting here. Probably she will fill, me, fill us in with more information that I really don't know because she got lots of uh, first-hand data from, uh, from the interview. Um, first of all, this study is part of a larger study uh, actually funded by IWR. Uh, IOW, IOW, Immigration Research for Us, uh, used to be called WK, and also uh, is directly funded by CIC and uh, hosted by the Institute of Rural Development from Brandon University. The, the plan is to survey 33 rural communities in the western region plus the three territories. Uh, I, I think you know how big the West Canada is. Uh, I didn't know until I see the map. I was like, are you kidding me? Uh, but we try to look at 33 communities out of all this large, you know, vast piece of land and see how um, settlement services have been provided in those areas and what are the service gaps. And particularly, we are interested to know about some communities which have not yet have any major structural coordination like the LIP. Uh, so we want to look at what happened to them. Uh, the, 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 the term newcomers we define in a very broad way uh, from permanent residents, refugees, refugees claimant, temporary foreign workers, naturalized citizens, international students, uh, have been around in Canada from one to five years. Um, and in British Columbia, we have a provincial panel uh, comprised of members from CIC, uh, the uh, British Columbia branch, and also the BC government, and also EMSA. Uh, with their support and also with their suggestion, we identified 10 communities. Later on, I'll show you which are the 10. And uh, standard, you know, it, as a standard practice for all the provinces, we did a phone survey uh, with agency executive level. Um, so we are targeting people who are providing service, uh, particularly for those who are in higher management. So this is nothing about the recipient, the service user. So I think that's different from what Laurie has been presenting so far. Um, and after we collect all the information we also did a uh, feedback section. Um, we talked to some of the organization and got some information from them. And here is the information. So you can see the, uh, okay, I have to be very careful. <laughs> yeah. So we basically surveyed uh, communities in different regions uh, in BC, from the north to the south, and also from the islands to the inland. 
Uh, these are the communities we got um, in each region. Uh, we know some of those you know, combinations are quite arbitrary, like the Terrace, Kitimat, and Smithers. Uh, actually, they are far, particularly in the winter, it's almost like inaccessible, you know, inaccessible from you know, one place to the other. And the other day, I was on the phone also with a colleague in um, Shishao. And then I find out, okay, from Gibson to Paul Weaver took about two hours. So, but, you know, um, for our, you know, we study purpose, we, we try to lump them together uh, according to geographic uh, proximity. So, all this area you can see have immigrants from 2008 to 13, even though the number is, may not be as big as what we see in uh, Lower Mainland, but still we have some immigrants into this area. And uh, these are the survey that we have done, and uh, these are the people number of people who have participated in the feedback section. So altogether, we have 43 respondents uh, respond to our survey, uh, and then we have 17 people providing feedback to us. And this is what I want to present to you. So there's some basic information about BC. I think you know, Laurie already did a very good job to uh, profile out what happened in BC. Uh, as we all know, majority permanent residents uh, came from the economic immigrants categories, although you know we have you know relatively more family reunion, uh, family family cars, um, new immigrants, and many also from Asian uh, Asia and Pacific region. Uh, but this is interesting, uh, which I think you all know. Uh, temporary residents actually now are more than permanent residents, so it's two times more. Uh, and then the other interesting trend we find uh, also from the um, the government's information is. Um, we have actually a lot of temporary residents turned permanent residents, uh, which is quite astonishing to me, okay, because I, you know, we, we have this check before we start. Uh, the government keep denying that not many people from temporary became permanent. Actually, the number tells us the other way. Uh, we have quite a lot of number turned from temporary residents into permanent residents. Uh, and in BC, uh, we, although, observe a decline in terms of uh, immigrants coming to BC, but we do have an increase of immigrants moving to long CMA area, so long census metropolitan area, so in other words, out of the major big city. Uh, actually, we have close to 8% of the immigrants coming to BC going to the rural area. Oh. And uh, the reason why, okay, according to we, you know, we, this, you know, the 17 people we, we talked to, the reason why People move to um, uh, rural areas. Basically, it's about economic you know, reason. One is about jobs, uh, particularly now in some area because of the natural gas development, the oil development, they just have a huge influx of temporary you know, residents and also permanent residents. And uh, study, uh, international student definitely is a key factor affecting, say, you know, UBC, you know, we have a campus in Kelowna. Uh, they have a huge change of population. And I, will, you know, I have a friend teaching at UNBC uh, in Fort St. John. A uh, few, you know, few months ago, he told me that you know, Fort St. John have an Indian restaurant right in the airport, uh, which is quite new. Uh, the reason why it's new, because they, you know, they have a community college there. Um, I don't know how many students there are from India, but there will be a you know, good enough number to support the business. Actually, the owner just opened a new restaurant in town. So in other words, there are two Indian restaurants in Fort St. John almost all tailored for in the lesson of students. So you can imagine how many are there. Uh, and then housing is another issue. You know, it's difficult for us to live in you know, metro areas. So many people have to move somewhere else to find housing. Uh, we have this story from, um, from our colleagues from Xixiao, one of the young people from, from Asian country. I'm not going to talk about which country, uh, 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 refugees. He moved to Powell Weaver uh, because of the cheap housing. And, but you can imagine, right, being by himself as one of the very few minority people living there. Uh, it's not an easy life for him to go. Yeah. Um, so in our survey divided into a few parts. The first part of questions we ask is about the settlement integrations experience and service in the area. Uh, this is what we get. About close to 60% of our respondents said that it's difficult or very difficult for newcomers to settle in their community. But in the meantime, we also have about 40% say it's not that difficult, it's relatively easy. Um, in, and then the second thing is we find is 76.2% agreed, over 25% of newcomers find it difficult to access service in their community. 
So this is quite a large number of respondents telling us that they, they observe, okay, newcomers to the community find it is, you know, difficult to, at least one out of four of newcomers find it difficult to find services, which I think echo what uh, Laurie just said. Um, all respondents also indicate that it's difficult for newcomers to obtain employment in their community. Um, for those, particularly, you know, have an increase of newcomers because of um, the development of LMG or liquid, is LMG? LMG and other, you know, resources development. Even though they find job, okay, many of them report that those jobs are relatively low skills. It's not good job, so the turnover is very high. Uh, and there's a huge mobility in the community because people couldn't find job, they move on, and then another group of people come in and pick up the job for a while, and then they left. Um, and also there's uh, environmental factors which, you know, we've been told again and again from, you know, different respondents in different areas. The rural area is different from urban area because it's quite, you know, the people are spreading quite far out in different areas with a vast piece of land. Uh, and also the weather in the winter is difficult for them to travel and lack of public transportation is also difficult for many of them. Mind you, many of the newcomers, according to our respondents, don't have a car. So if you don't have a car, there's no public transportation, you are stuck, you're not going anywhere. And particularly in the winter, you cannot even walk. So this is the problem in the, you know, in the rural area. Um, the four most cited barriers uh, from the respondents is number one, language. Again, I think this concurs with what Laurie have found. Language is a major barrier. Finding affordable housing and finding a job uh, is very difficult. And confusion about where to get help. Again, you know, this is also concur with, you know, some of the findings just uh, presented to you and uh, lack of local social connections uh, because the number of newcomers in the, in the community is relatively small and uh, particular people from the ethnic community is not that large number so many of them don't have the social connections or people they can go to. And uh, when we ask about settlement service uh, that CIC eligible permanent residents need Okay, or the service they have provided, this is what we get. Sorry, you, that was for all immigrants. For, all yeah, for all, yeah. It wasn't just for LG, CIC eligible. Right. Oh. Okay, sorry. sorry. This is a check. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So this is the uh, settlement service provided by by uh, all the settlement service organizations. Um, it's not like Jenny just correct, this is not just for CIC eligible, but most of the services are only accessible for CIC eligible recipient. In other words, some of the organizations did try to provide service outside the contract, okay, the, the agreement. Um, so you can, I particularly want to highlight the color one. We ask three things. One is, what are you offering? Second is, what do you want to see be expanded? And then number, number three is, what do you think is needed, which is not provided? So we can, we can tell language, go across all. So there's some language services, but definitely not enough. And uh, if we look at information and orientation, again, it's provided, but again, you can see it's expected, you know, and also people want it to be expanded. Particularly, later on you see, they want to expand this service to temporary residents, right? Because many of them are now on, are not eligible to get these services. Uh, if we look at the green one, helping finding a job service for senior in social inclusion and integration support, they have been provided now, but half of the respondents, more than half of the respondents, want these services to be expanded. Uh, number one is because of the budget now is not enough for all the CIC eligible uh, you know, service recipient. In the meantime, they also see this service should be expanded to people who are not under the CIC eligibility category. The reason is they see more temporary residents than permanent residents in the community. So those people need help. Oh. And uh, CIC e let e eligible newcomers this is the services that they will see to have, okay, in their communities. It's quite extensive. So basically 70% of the respondents reporting that following needs, okay. You can see how extensive all these needs. 
for CIC long eligible newcomers. And we are, the, another set of questions we ask them is about the organizational capacity. So we want to know whether the organization have the ability to provide the services for the newcomers in the, in the, in the area. Uh, as you can tell, I try to highlight them and use different color. Uh, most of them feel that they have adequate uh, capacity in doing these few things. But if you look, when we ask, okay, what, do you, what are you lacking at this point? Okay, in terms of the adequacy, so you can see, providing service in both official language and uh, financial is the major concern. They really want to have more resources and mobilization, mobilizing community to support newcomers is also something they think they need to have more. And coordination of services with other, other SPOs, this is also what people think they, they lack of at this point, okay, the adequacy in terms of doing all this. But if we look at this one, okay, we ask eight different things, and these are all listed. In other words, all the organizations, all the respondents feel that if we really look at the capacity, they are not really up to the point yet. They need more resources, they want to do more. Okay, at this point, they don't have it. So, for our you know, conversation uh, in group and also full telephone conference and email, this is what we get, okay? The major reason why they think they are not, they do not have enough capacity to meet the future need is they don't have the funding, particularly the lack of core funding, okay? Without core funding, they cannot do anything because the worker have to do almost even cleaning the office. So how can they do so many things? So we also ask them whether they have done any planning and checking. Uh, we are, you know, if you can look at this, if you look at this too, okay? To a certain extent, most of the organization have either doing by themselves or with other organization in terms of strategic planning, in terms of need assessment. But in terms of reporting, okay, it is relatively low. Not many of them have been doing reporting. And uh, community partnership, which is one of our concerns, uh, whether they need to have some, you know, whether they have community partnership and what do they need to, in, in order to, you know, reinforce or strengthen their community partnership. So what we find is community partnership with other SPOs are common, okay? Particularly many of them mentioned to us because of the previous provincial welcoming community initiative. They already built up certain kind of network in the community. Unfortunately, the CIC funding basically destroyed the whole network they have. Uh, but even so, many of them reported that majority of them reported that they still have collaboration with other organizations in terms of providing service, in terms of, provi in terms of providing welcoming activities, and also in terms of offering integration supports to the newcomers in the community. At least 75% with, you know, working with schools, school boards, umbrella organization, business, li public library, and labor market services. But when we ask, okay, what do they want to see more? Many of them express a strong desire to work with employers who are unwilling to take time to attend meetings. Actually, this is not just their problem, and I'm sitting in a few committees in the city of Vancouver. We also have the same problem. Employers just not actively engage in those kind of conversations. We activate and expand previous you know, uh, welcoming community initiative. But the interesting thing is when we ask them whether they want to have a lip, majority of them say no. Okay. Uh, we only, you know, have about two out of the ten communities we receive some, you know, feedback. They want to have a lip. The reason is because of the geographical factors and many other factors. They don't see a lip can serve their community well. They want to have something more organic, something that they can bring people together, but not in a very mechanic, structural way. So finally, we want to look at okay, what is the rural uniqueness? Um, similar discrimination conditions and practice from the rural and the urban area, including foreign credential issue language, racial discrimination, lack of social connection, service, and resources. This is not new. This is not just the rural area. I think many of our colleagues working in the lower mainland also experience similar you know, issue. But particularly, you need to rural community. Number one, men, people mentioned about the geographical challenge. We already mentioned about that. Second, the unfamiliar encounter, because you can imagine in a rural community, they used to have about 10 or 20 newcomers who are not white going to there. All of a sudden, now you have 202,000 
influx into the community. That creates lots of you know, uneasiness in the long-term residents. Not that they want to discriminate them, but you know, they just don't know how to deal with them. And definitely there are other you know, structural issues need to you know, lots of discriminatory, discriminatory practice. And many of those organizations serve in you know, small areas or small agencies. They just don't have the enough resources to deal with this very flexible, very multifaceted, needed group of people. Uh, and economic driven is a very interesting part. They drive for economic factors. Uh, it really attracts a lot of new newcomers who have relatively no skills. And also the economic cycle, right? as we you know, know, when the BC government said we are going to develop LP LG LPG, and all of a sudden, the big companies say we are not going in. So people go in, and now no more, no more job, they go out. It's always affecting how they, how they work in this small town. Uh, and the rigid eligibility for CIC also you know, really limit their ability to help people who are not falling into the so-called CIC legitimate you know, criteria. And we particularly want to highlight secondary migrations in rural BC is also a major issue. We have lots of um, already you know, naturalized Canadian citizens moved to small town BC and we have heard about a case working in uh, the Sunshine Coast. He's a chef. He been, became a Canadian over five years ago, uh, but he didn't speak, he does not speak Chinese. The only things he does every day is work in the kitchen, right? So he doesn't need to even deal with the customer. So because he worked in the kitchen so busy, he doesn't even have time to go for, you know, ESL training. So this is what happened in, you know, they have lots of people going there and who really like, you know, get a citizenship and do not fall into the you know, surface eligibility and need help. So this is the problem they have. So we have a very small suggestions. One is we think we need to have a more flexible and contextualized funding model and surface eligibility for rural communities. So we need also creative and flexible service delivery model, organic partnership model, and special services for long el eligible newcomers. Second, funding to support welcoming initiative that can bring people together. And the number three is, we hope IRW or the CIC will consider funding of study to look at the short-term and long-term impact of economic-driven um, increase of newcomers in rural communities. Because at this point, we just don't know. We only know there's lots of people going in. They don't have enough service. But what does it mean to the community? Right? In the long run, this is something we need to find out. Okay. And uh, last but not least, we want to acknowledge all the people who have been helping us in doing this project. Uh, I have to say, you know, we are very proud of what we have done because we are the only province we have finished our report. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much, Mew. And we will um, ask you to stay up front and invite Laurie up front as well. So this is where it starts to become more of a conversation and much less of a presentation. And just echoing uh, Laurie's comment to you during her presentation is she's looking forward to comments from you, not just questions and maybe some sense making. So encouraging each and every one of you as settlement uh, providing organizations, um, be curious with some of the data and information that you had uh, heard. And um, as I said, be part of the conversation. So we've got about uh, 40 minutes for uh, opportunities for sharing ideas and questions. We've got Bahar Tahiri. Where's Bahar? There you are up front, or sorry, up on, the, on my left, not in front at all. And uh, Mary and Kay from AMSA, that right there. And they will bring the microphone to those of you in the room with your questions and comments. And we're going to alternate those questions and comments um, with our online participants. And we've got uh, Katie Rosenberger down here, Program Director of AMSA, will read the online questions. So for those of you in the room, please raise your hand um, if you'd like to ask a question or have a comment, and Bahar and Marion will come to you with the wireless microphone. Please wait until you actually have the microphone right in front of you um, to begin speaking so that everyone online can hear you as well. And for those of you participating online, please email your questions, um, as you can see on your screen, to events at amsa.org. Also, too, just a reminder, since we really do have a limited amount of time for this session, or for this part of the session, please try to keep your questions as clear and concise as possible. And I know some of you might be kind of 
outside thinkers as we go and trying to make sense of all of the data you just heard, but try and have it captured quite tightly. Now, in case we're unable to get to all of the questions today, we're going to forward the unanswered questions directly to Mu and to Lori, and they will be answered uh, following the event. So I think, Marianne, do we have uh, somebody ready to go already? That's lovely. I have a comment, actually, an observational comment, because it was very interesting. It's related to the social belonging and uh, to the factor of the BC has, especially Vancouver, has a lot of condos and condo livers, uh, residents living in there. It, it was, it, 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 I, I, the, it's a question and a comment. I wondered, has anybody done any studies about people who reside in condos and whether they are really as isolating fa as, as we perceive them or think that they are. Because if you really look at it, I, you know, the interaction of your neighbors in a condo situation, you can't avoid them. You're in elevators. You actually have to. Uh, you you have to probably know more of them, uh, because as as you kind of interact uh, casually, and as and the casual leads to all of those other co informal conversations. Plus, I the the other thing in residences in condos that they there are some residents who or whatever you call the strata councils have very deliberate like meet and greet on a weekly basis or whatever. I, I just wanted to know whether there, there is any validity in sort of stereotyping, if I may call it that way, uh, condo, li condo liver uh, residence uh, equals you know, social isolation. Now, sorry, just before you respond to that, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind, um, just to add before you start to share your comment or question, if you could introduce yourself so we can put some names to, um, okay. to the people in the room. That would be lovely. So, thank you. I'm Sandra Wilking from Success. Thanks, Sandra. So, so um, that is a good comment about, you know, all our, our condos really like that. And... Um, I had to rely on American research on that, so um, I don't know if there's been a lot of Canadian research on how, you know, the condo dwelling life. There certainly isn't any research that I know of that looks at immigration and condo living either. So um, I think, you know, I can only guess as to why that may or may not be. Um, if I'd be interested in looking at, you know, the condos that are co-ops, um, like that, that are more cooperative um, communal places to live than some of the, the you know, so like the ones that you talked about having, you know, meets and greets and, and, and have those kinds of interactions as opposed to other ones where you meet once a year and you fight about the person who's making noise uh, above you, that sort of thing. So um, I'm only guessing at this point and I can't tell from the data um, why that might be happening because we, I just simply don't have that kind of information. Anything to add, Mew? I don't have any research to back up. I live in a condo. <laughs> 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 well, participant observation, that's what I do. Um, I, I think, number one, um, the isolation issue in the urban area is not new. Actually, in sociology, right, my understanding is there's a theory already in the 60s it's called mass society theory. Uh, in the urban area, you know, people just don't know each other. And Jane Jacob, uh, it's one of the great urban planning uh, theories. <clears throat> also mentioned about you know urban living also isolate people. Going back to condo, you know my condo is a not a big condo. We have about forty you know uh, unit in our in our area. People don't talk to each other until we have a crisis, and then people split and argue with each other. And now the crisis is gone. Everybody go back and quiet, and nobody talk to each other again. <laughs> uh, not that we don't see each other. We see each other. We say hello. Uh, but we don't really, you know, go to your place to have dinner or something like that. We just don't eat that. What I want to say is, um, when we when we look at many of those survey, uh, when we ask people about the interaction with people, it's not just say hello, not hello, something like that. Uh, most of the study trying to look for a little bit deeper than that, uh, and obviously those deeper kind of social interaction is not really taking place, even though people try. Uh, 
Uh, but very often, due to various reasons, uh, people just don't. And I can tell you, many of my family run condo, they will be very careful before they go out. They want to make sure there's nobody waiting in the elevator lobby because they don't want to say hello to people. So not that they don't run into people, but they just don't want to run into people. So I, you know, I think this is one of the, you know, I, I think conceptually one of the things for sociology and for many research now is many of those concepts are built from a ideal type mm -hmm. of community, which doesn't exist even in rural area now. But somehow I think very often those concepts are still stuck and we're still using those concepts to look at what happened in, in the uh, uh, you know, urban area, particularly in the so-called post-technology area now. All right. Thanks very much, Mio. Sometimes it's the anecdotal information that, that's uh, the, the most engaging. Um, Bahar, do you have someone? Right. My name is Germain Tano. I am uh, with the uh, BC Francophone Immigration Program. I am assi uh, the Assistant Program Manager. Uh, my question is uh, for Lori. Uh, I saw on one of your slides the uh, Francophone uh, community population is BC. I saw 0%. So uh, my question is, I would like to know, how did you get this number? <laughs> because I, I'm a little bit concerned. <laughs> yeah, uh, because soon I will not have no job. <laughs> so right now we have a funding from CIC to help uh, Francophone immigrants in BC. And if it's true there is no Francophone here, you know, I'm in, in a big trouble now. <laughs> so can you help me? <laughs> so how did you get this number? What's your definition of francophone did you use? And uh, my other question is for, for both of you. Have you looked at the uh, need of francophone immigrants in BC? Can you tell us some, some of your thoughts about it? Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, I looked at my table again. It's 0.8 of 1%, and that's for one year. Um, and those aren't my numbers. Those are from Citizenship and Immigration Canada of actual landings of, of um, Francophone um, immigrants to BC. Um, I have to do a little calculation in my head. I mean, it's more than 1,000 people that we're talking about. Um, but as a percentage of the whole, um, very uh, smaller numbers of, of, of French-speaking immigrants uh, to BC, but that's a Citizenship and Immigration Canada number, not mine. Um, and I thank you for asking me about um, the settlement experiences of French-speaking immigrants because um, the Pan-Canadian, Western Canadian, um, Alberta, and the Longitudinal Survey of Immigrants to Canada um, were available in multiple languages, including French. And none of those surveys was able to access enough French-speaking immigrants to say much. Um, so I do have some um, data on French-speaking immigrants, but not enough to compare women with men or compare uh, provinces against provinces. So um, uh, Citizenship and Immigration Canada is aware that our knowledge of French-speaking immigrants outside of, of New Brunswick and Quebec is... Uh, faulty, um, and I'm hoping that they would fund us uh, to do some research on French-speaking immigrants, but um, uh, we just simply weren't able to get enough to participate for reasons that I don't understand because we even approached them speaking French. We didn't approach speaking English. Well, in our study, I think we touch on a little bit about Francophone, but I don't think we have any significant number to show about, you know, um, services and issue in Francophone in the rural area. And I suspect the number is not that large to a certain extent. Yeah. But don't mind you, okay, we, are, we have a very different target. We are looking at agency. We are not looking at service recipient, though. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Katie, do you have something from online? I do. I have several questions, um, but I'll just start with one. So Anne and Hildy would both like to have each of you define rural um, and the definition you used for rural for your uh, presentations, please. 
So in our study, um, it's non-CMA, non-CA, so it's any community that's 10,000 people or less. Whatever she said. <laughs> The project is defined by IWL, uh, ILW, I, I keep, keep mixing <laughs> ILW, so to some extent I'm uh, using the similar term, yeah. What, one of the, so with, with Mu's project in particular, we're most interested in looking at the smaller centers that are getting large numbers of immigrants. Um, and so not looking at Vancouver or Victoria, um, but looking, you know, at Prince Rupert and, and um, uh, Fort Saskatchewan, that sort of thing. So. Um, Maybe a, a little more kind definition of, of rural, but uh, for us in the in the study that I'm doing, it's 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 ten thousand people or less per area. Great, Marianne. Okay, hi, uh, Aaron Cheng from Citizenship and Immigration Canada. I just like to ask a few questions about the uh, findings on discrimination, and I understand in one of your slides you showed that. Um, there's a low number of reported uh, experience of discrimination among newcomers. Uh, in another finding that 81% of uh, uh, you know, people of Asian heritage uh, reported uh, experience of discrimination. My question is this, uh, was there any follow-up question on uh, the level of interaction of those who reported that they never had any experience of discrimination with people outside their cultural community? Because in the Lower Mainland, it's very easy not to go outside your community. And so maybe that's the reason why there is that low perception of discrimination. I don't know if there's a follow-up question on that. And also the other question is whether the same definitions were used in those two um, slides, where one shows there's 81% of the people reporting experience of discrimination, and the other shows the opposite, that there's low discrimination. So I'll take your second question. The, um, the, the questions that we used were different from the ones that were used um, in, in this other study. Um, but if you drill into the Western Canadian and Pan-Canadian settlement surveys, certainly um, particular groups will be experiencing discrimination at higher rates than other groups will. And the pattern that we're seeing is, is that um, we can look at Chinese groups separately, um, Indian groups separately, but we can't look at anybody else separately, and we find the higher rates of discrimination um, experienced by those two groups. Um, so we see the same trend, just not the same magnitude, and I think it's because the questions that were asked that were different. Um, you had asked, um, was there a question on the survey about how much interaction you have um, with groups outside your ethnic group? Sadly, on none of those surveys um, is there a question on that. Um, but I suspect that that's also um, an issue that contributes to sense of belonging um, and, and discrimination, that puzzle. Um, I should mention that all of the surveys, except for the Longitudinal Survey of Immigrants to Canada, were um, 15 minutes long. Uh, so we weren't able to ask those, those questions, but I think that that's a, a, certainly a possibility. Great, thank you. Pahar, anyone on your side? Hi, <clears throat> excuse me, Catherine Rockwell. I'm from Listen, formerly Elsinet. That's uh, language, uh, settlement language. Um, and um, I spent 18 years in the classroom, hundreds of hours with newcomer uh, language learners in Burnaby. And so a couple of things stand out. One is um, unpacking a little bit the impact of family class and blank belonging. And so if indeed BC has a higher rate of family class uh, newcomers. Um, being part of a family might explain why uh, you don't need help. That was one of the, sta the, the statistics you had around um, uh, reasons for not accessing immigrant <laughs> services because you don't need help. And if you're living in or with family, perhaps that's an explanation. Um, family can also be, in a sense, isolating from uh, the wider community because of the time and uh, number of events and, and social structure that's all family-based, and that may be a good thing, but it may also result in a, in a lack of integration into um, the wider community. Um, and then finally, um, over the many, the, the decades that I was working in Burnaby, um, 
my colleagues and I noticed, and this is completely unscientific, but <laughs> we, we noticed more and more um, of our clients were, uh, even if they, they describe themselves officially as permanent residents, they uh, emotionally were temporary residents in that they were intending to uh, exit Canada after their children had finished their education or at least got into university. Um, and so, although we were mandated to assist them with their settlement, they, they didn't really um, identify as needing that. Um, and they and their, their partners were often multinationals in that they, they lived in a variety of company, countries throughout the year for different periods of time. And so that's, that, that lifestyle um, is very, it's very uh, disruptive to, to social networks and, and, and integrating into a, into a society. Anyway, those are my observations. Thank you, those are um, very helpful. Um, I think um, you know the issue of family class um, immigrants less likely to need help. Um, I, I think is a is a good observation. Um, you also mentioned about um, you know being part of a newcomer family. You have a unit. You're isolated from the wider society. I think that's also very interesting. Because I don't think maybe Mew knows uh, there hasn't been a lot of research about how families, newcomer families, interact as a group. Um, but there's been research about Canadian-born families and how people in families who have children are more networked, more participatory because their kids go out and they they play sports, they're involved in school, um, maybe they take their children to a place of worship. Um, so people with children tend to be more networked and more um, have larger friends and networks than people who aren't. And I'm wondering maybe, I don't know of any research that's looked at families and immigrant families, because it seems to me that's probably the exact opposite. You're too busy trying to settle, you know, get a good job, get a better job, learn the language maybe, learn the culture, help your kids settle, and all of that stuff takes time, right? It, a time away from, you know, your, your leisure time. So I, that, that could be um, an explanation. Um, and this a bit where, you know, people are emotionally temporary residents, um, I think could be very interesting to, um, to look at because when you ask people about their intention, their intention doesn't always match their actions, which is true. We may find that 90% of the people who think they're going to leave actually never do leave. But if your mind is in that, you know, I'm not going to stay here, then you know, of course, why would you invest in, in um, settling in the community if you think that you're going to be leaving? Um, and I don't think that, you know, we certainly don't have, the Canadian government doesn't release figures on out-migration or re-migration. We just simply assume that immigrants come here and they stay. And we also simply assume that temporary immigrants and international students come here and they want to stay, right? And I think it's kind of this smugness of Canadians, you know, thinking that, you know, we're the, you know, a country people want to be in. And you know why would you want to leave, right? It's kind of a smug kind of attitude, and so um, you know, really, that could also be an explanation. And maybe there's more people like that in Vancouver than other places too. Um, when you were talking about it, I was thinking about the um, the Lebanese um, situation about five years ago. You know, where we had, you know, we flew out almost 50,000 people with Canadian passports who were currently living in Lebanon. Um, so I wonder, you know, maybe the extent to which I'm emotionally temporary. Um, that's a very interesting idea, and thank you for that. That's great. I, um, I have a theory. Um, according to, you know, the previous study I have done, um, actually there was a study I just completed a few, just published, you know, a couple months ago. Um, we interviewed 18 young people who born or grew up in Canada and now working in Hong Kong. And the funny thing is, when we ask each of them, okay, each of them said strongly that they identify themselves as Canadian more than Chinese. So I think that study somehow draws some attention from CIC. I got a call and then people ask me for the paper. The reason is there's always an understanding or assumption that, you know, 
Chinese youth, particularly you know, young people from Chinese family, have a lower self lower identity with the Canadian citizenship. Uh, but turn out, you know, at least the 18 people we interviewed have a different saying. Uh, and in mo most of my study about you know, youth growing up in immigrants' family, particularly from Chinese and South Asians, there's a couple things affect you know, how they interact with people. And that also reflects how their parents, the first generation, you know, uh, interact with the society. Number one is you know, there's a huge, you know, large ethnic enclave. Say, for example, if you live in Richmond, Chinese, you basically don't need to speak English. And you work well, you get a job, you go, you know, go by every day, you have all the things sorted out without even interact with anyone in English. Um, and then the second thing is, um, because you don't need to even find a job. And, you know, if you look at the data, what Laurie present, women is a very interesting group. Yeah. Uh, they have lower employment and less feeling being discriminated. Part of the reason I thought is because they just don't have the interaction with people who are not from the Chinese community or from the South Asian community. So how would they feel they're being discriminated? Right, so I think this is one of the reasons. And then the other thing is we also find consistently in the South Asians and Chinese family, they all adhere to their own cultures, their home cultures, right? And the way they adhere to their own culture is not just you know, eating food or something like that. They, they watch TV produced from their home country. They have you know, internet you know, conversations, you know, Skype and visit the family you know, all yearly or something like that. And this is you know, making the, the, the younger generation less under, you know, understood to the Canadian culture to a certain extent. But I think the most important thing is you can see how the first generation immigrants live their life. Right? They live in a very transnational life. It's not like what we think they should be. Like you know, you're in Canada, you should eat, you, know, you should go to Tim Horton and watch hockey or something like that. They don't. <laughs> they watch Bollywood, they try watch Chinese movie and go for dim sum and even you know, fly back to China and Hong Kong you know, to buy stuff. And, um, you know, I, I think the last thing I want to point out is probably I would like, you know, to see, okay, the, the a, a variable of age and also generation mm -hmm. and see whether there's any difference in terms of, you know, experience, experience of discrimination, sense of belonging. There may be difference because there's a huge intergeneration difference yeah. as, you know, at least from what we observe, yeah. Great, thank you. A great comment to get uh, get our presenters thinking, and I think it's always a good sign when researchers are taking notes. Because stay tuned for another research paper. <laughs> it's great, thank you, Katie. Yeah. Who do you have online? Okay, I'm going to start with a comment and then a question. So the comment is from um, Fort Nelson, and uh, the two ladies have said, "Dr. Yan has described our situation in the rural north with absolute accuracy." Everything he discussed was relevant to what we experience in terms of barriers to newcomers. In these areas which are underpopulated and very much dependent on the influx of newcomers, we need to pay serious attention to these unique factors. Thank you for recognizing the varying dynamics of the province. That's your comment. Okay. Followed by a question. It says, I work with seniors and would like to know where can I get data on senior immigration patterns or studies on the challenges that this immigration category face, particularly in BC, but interested in info concerning other provinces. That is a big frontier, which, um, you know, sadly there aren't a lot of people who are working on that issue. Um, and. It is a major issue because immigrants are aging too. <laughs> um, and it's shocking, actually. I, sp I spoke at, a, at an aging conference in February, and they had me out because there wasn't a lot of people they knew that could speak to aging and immigration. And there just isn't a lot. Um, so, if Katie, if you share with me their contact information, I can send the presentation that I gave to them uh, to the to that group. But you know, one of the things we talked about are things like um, when a person gets sick, they start to revert back to their home language, right? That you know, when you're sick, it's too hard to speak your second or your third language. And when you think about 
um, our <coughs> situation in Canada, we have, more, you know, 20% of the population wasn't born here. Um, and as they start aging, some of them will start getting sick. And the capacity that we have at hospitals to deal with, um, uh, you know, immediate emergencies and language issues um, might be good in, in the big cities, but not so good even in medium-sized cities, and I can't imagine in a uh, you know, place like Fort Nelson where you know, the capacity might be negative. And then if some people need long-term care, um, and you can't, you know, it's fine to have an interpreter with you, you, know, when, you go, when you go to the doctor, but you really need somebody who can speak your language and relate to you you know, on a you know on a daily basis. So how how are we going to help that population? Is because they're going some of them are going to get sick and need long term care. And uh, people, when you explain it to people like that, they go, Oh yeah, that's that's really important. But then nothing happens. So uh, <laughs> I can't really say much more than that, except that um, it is something on the back of my mind, uh, definitely. Great. Thanks very much. Our side over here. Sure. Hi there. My name is Ethan Yoon with Citizenship and Immigration. And uh, this is just touching back on the, I guess, the discrepancy between the discrimination and the sense of belonging. Um, I'm wondering if in BC you're able to plot maybe the locations of some of the, uh, for some of the, the statistics uh, for your numbers because, or sorry, the, where they reside. Um, just because I think, particularly in BC, um, going back to what Aaron said, the immigrant experience in certain uh, pockets of the Lower Mainland mm -hmm. are going to be significantly different than I think across Canada or even in rural communities, mm -hmm. just because of the, the culturally, uh, I guess, gentrified communities. Um, I think that would help just because I don't think it's a level playing field, the immigrant experience in these pockets versus other, uh, versus other areas. So the only study that I can do that with is with the Western Canadian Settlement Survey because it's data that I was involved in collecting myself. Um, the pan-Canadian, it's all masked. So I can't tell you, I can just tell you that they're not living in a CMA or a CAA with the pan-Canadian. That's a lot more people in it. Um, in the Western Canadian Settlement Survey, there's 800 respondents from BC. Um, and so I'd have a smaller number of people living in, in rural areas, but I might be able to say something about some of the bigger places that are small. <laughs> um, but, but not an awful lot because the numbers start getting really small um, after that. But I, I think you make a good point about that period because I think about um, Winnipeg and the flavor that racism has in Winnipeg is very different than what it is in Edmonton or, or Vancouver, and it, it happens because of the, the, the group of people who are there. Great, thank you. Bahar. Got yes, uh, um, Pascaline uh, Sequeira with uh, the Francophone Immigration, uh, with La Fédération de Francophones. I have just a couple of questions very um, to clarify. Um, I, I'm sure probably you have um, these numbers uh, in your mind. It's for uh, Dr. Wilkinson. It's about the non-access to services. Um, in, um, uh, how do you, how a different uh, class of immigrants, um, uh, how, I mean, I would like to know in terms of the classes of immigrants, um, percentages of, of non-access uh, non to services. Amongst the Francophone immigrants no, or just everybody no, no, in ju general? Just in general. Yeah. yeah. So um, of the people who don't access services, um, approximately 40% of them say they need services. So um, that would be in the Pan-Canadian Settlement Survey, um, you know, you're looking around about 1,000 people um, in the survey that we, um, we conducted. Um, if we were to blow that up, I guess I'd have to, um, if you give me a couple minutes, I can work out the numbers for you. <laughs> but I was, I, was think, I was just wondering in terms of the immigrant categories. Oh, okay, so um, uh, we are looking at that right now. Um, and I can say preliminarily that it's the family class that ask for it more often that don't get the services. That, and so we're looking at why that would be. So we're looking at um, language acquisition, um, where they're living, um, sex differences, that sort of thing. But I don't quite have those numbers ready yet. Okay. Um, but before uh, before the end of the of the year, I will have them. 
And my other uh, small question is for uh, Dr. Uh, Mu Chan Yang. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I noticed you talked, you talked about 8% um, uh, in terms of rural movement of immigrants, 8%. Um, are these permanent, resident, permanent residents or does that include temporary residents as well? Sorry, I can't. Um, I just retain in, in your presentation that uh, about 8% yeah. of immigrants um, goes to the rural areas. Uh, no, they go to, well, put it this way, they go outside the CMA. Uh -huh. The CMA basically is about Victoria and when, you know, when Cooper started the major CMA. So actually, you know, that goes back to the question, the earlier question is what is the rural? Um, that means they're going to long traditional areas, like, you know, Vancouver, Victoria, those kind of you know area. So they go to Lenny, you know Lenny become one of the uh, area. They go to um, Whistler, those those area. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I see. And that's uh, for permanent res only permanent. Res that that's the data for permanent residence. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. And we've got time for one more question, and we'll offer that up to our online audience. Katie. Thank you. So I have a question from Deray from Mosaic. And she says, it was great to see the experience of discrimination in BC was lowest. My question is about how the voice of marginalized communities within immigrant communities has been reflected. For example, I believe the experience of LGBTQ newcomers would be very different. Any thoughts? I believe so too, but we didn't ask that question. Um, we didn't ask a lot of questions. <laughs> um, so uh, to me, um, this just leads us to, to, I know CIC hates when we say this, but we need more money for <laughs> research. <laughs> but the, the LGBTT question, huge. Again, kind of like the seniors question, not really been dealt with. Um, so, you know, kind of another frontier for us to, to explore. Great, thank you. And I do appreciate that there's some other questions out there that we don't have time for. I, I view that as a really good sign that there's uh, enough interest in conversations that the conversation will go on. So as we mentioned earlier, we're committed to getting those answers to you. So please do email them to events at amsa.org and uh, the responses will come back to you.